what went through your mind when you were told you're going to be Sam? Yeah. Did you read the books? I... Okay, I had never heard of The Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna, this is gonna, I guess, like, diminish the value of a degree from the from UCLA, where I graduated with a double degree history and American literature and culture with honors. Nice. Voted book of the century. And they, <laughs> yeah, eventually. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, um, you know, these lists, who put that list together? Um, can't wait to meet this guy, Pulitzer. <laughs> but the, um, the, the, my agent called, Nikki Marish, at William Morris. Now, then I was at William Morris. Darling, honey, honey, she was like right out of central casting. You have to have a flawless British accent by Tuesday. Like, okay, I can do that, I can do that. You know, like actors, you put stuff on your resume, like horseback riding and fencing, and they're like, great, they want you to fence. And you're like, tomorrow? I can learn fencing in the night. That's not a problem. I'll, I'll be a fencer. I can be anything you want me to be. So, um, what is it? She goes, Peter Jackson is doing the Lord of the Rings trilogy for New Line. And I heard Peter Jackson, who directed The Frighteners, and my dad played the judge in The yes. Frighteners. Peter Jackson is doing blah, 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 trilogy, New Line. That's what I heard, and like, <laughs> trilogy, I mean, if it's Peter Jackson, it's gonna be a big movie, and if it's a trilogy, now you're in this epic whatever. But, and, and she said, you know the books, right? And I was like, The Phantom Tollbooth? <laughs> no, no. She goes, it's the sequels to The Hobbit. I'm like, right, The Hobbit. <laughs> My mom read to me all the time as a kid, but she read like Steinbeck. Like the pearl and stuff, like, uh, you know, of mice and men. I didn't get Bilbo and the dwarves with the singing plates and all that stuff. I didn't get that. I was in totally dragons. I love dragons. I, who knew anything about dragons? No dragons in the Lord of the so, um, so I was like, okay, okay, yeah, uh, yeah, of course, of course, yeah, of course. So it was one of those phones in the car. This was 1998, 1999, early 99. And uh, so I'm driving, and I hang up the phone, like, on the big <laughs> brick thing you have to hang it up on. And uh, I turned my car around, I went right to Barnes & Noble, and um, that's a bookstore. Now, for those of you who don't know what a bookstore is... Hey, I like Barnes & Noble. Yeah, me too. Thank God for Barnes & Noble. Mm -hmm, yeah. There should be more brick and mortar, yeah. you know. Someplace you can go and read up with your computer. Um, so, 3-Wi-Fi-Wi-Fi-Wi-Fi-Wi-Fi-Wi-Fi-Wi-Fi-Wi-Fi-Wi-Fi-Wi-Fi-Wi-Fi-Wi-Fi-Wi-Fi-W
<laughs> like, okay, someone's giving you a Gardner, 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 Gardner. And I, I, like, I had just got my degree at UCLA, and one of the things you learn about when you study literature is like the importance of gardening. It's really, really kind of like the end state of any great journey is the return home, is to put your hands in the soil, is to grow food and have family and like that. So I was like, I like the Gardner thing. And, um, and the descriptions of, I didn't like the, all the fat stuff. <laughs> okay, he's a fat hobbit, I get it. And then, uh, and, and I didn't like, I didn't know how I felt about the hobbits bursting into tears all the time. <laughs> They're always bursting into tears. They're very emotionally available. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I, they had sent through the audition scene. And the audition scene was from, was Shelob. I can never tell what, which movies, which, which book third is which. One? Probably, Probably the third one. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's right before the stairs. It's, I think it's called, is it Shelob's Lair? Is that the title of the yeah, chapter? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, don't go where I can follow. He's not asleep. He's dead. Right? And like, you read this dialogue and you think, yeah, monkey could get this part. If you can just say the words, you can't mess up this dialogue. It's, it's too perfect. And, um, and then I, I told my wife, I think on the way home, the phone from Barnes and Noble that I had to have a British accent. That it was you can't fake it. They're not going to. You have to. I have to be able to do it. So by the time I got home, my wife had gone to the ta the trades, Hollywood Reporter, Variety, whatever, and she'd flipped through and she found a dialect coach and she called him and hired him. Like good wife, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So and I was like, okay, tomorrow or whatever, you're going to have a meeting with Howard or something. So we we. I sat down with the, that guy, and it was like, I felt really comfortable, and he was like, you got this. He's like, you're, you're gonna get this part. You're gonna get this part. So, once I got to the place in the book that maybe the first audition scene was, I stopped reading. And then I just focused on the audition scene. Now, my dad had worked for Peter, and I knew that Peter and Fran, their partners, writing partners, producing partners, liked me. They liked me because, just come over just one seat, just one seat, thank you so much. I'm just looking at this pretty lady right now. All right, so, that's all right. So, it's intimate, it's just us. So, they... We're well, honestly the best way to go. <laughs> so, uh, they, they had seen Rudy. They had seen me and Rudy with my dad, and they called me with Michael J. Fox from their, like, garage screening room like years earlier, a couple years earlier, and were telling me how much they love my performance and all this stuff. So when I went into audition, I knew that it was like a friendly room. I knew they were in New Zealand and we were gonna be put on tape, but I knew they were gonna see this tape. And I knew that, they're, that when they push play, that they would be, they'd wanna like whatever they saw. Which is, a lot of times when you audition for stuff, it doesn't feel like that. You walk in and you almost feel like the default setting of the people who are casting is to like get people out of the way. Like, you know, they'll, they'll know when they see what they want, but until then, like, okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Like they're hardwired to excuse you from the room before you've even started. And that's where actors get nervous. Cause like, you don't wanna, you don't wanna hear the gong you don't want the hook to come out of the room and yank you out of the room, and that's exactly what it feels like happening. But I knew this one, and Victoria Burroughs, the casting director, had cast my dad in Frighteners, and she cast my brother in some TV show, and when, we, when I saw her at like the Frighteners screening or some, somewhere else, she was always like, I gotta find something for you. I gotta find something for you. So like, all the signs were pointing in the yes direction, aside from the fact that I didn't know the books, but, um, <laughs> So I went in there and I auditioned for it, nailed it, it's like impossible not to get it right, it's so good, and uh, she gave me a big hug, and then she had to be professional too, she had other actors coming in, but like, you could tell for the, for the, the moments that I was with Victoria, and the moments where I was doing those, that audition, she wanted me to win, she, she was rooting for me, and she was probably the same way with other actors that she brought in too. And it's really kind of painful to think of that because you'd like to think that somebody's just on your team. But really what's at stake is like finding the most right 
performer to fit the most right part at that moment in time when that thing is being made. So I had to wait for a long time. And then, uh, I can't remember the order of operations exactly, but Peter and Fran were gonna come to LA and they were gonna meet a few people and they wanted me to come in and read in person. Which to me was like I got the part. Uh, and I remember going in there again, wasn't really nervous. Maybe I was a little nervous, but like when the work started, when it was time to do it, um, I don't know, there was just a seriousness of purpose that clicked in. Like this is, this is important. And I, I you know, I, if I'm doing a voiceover animated character, or if I'm doing a student film for some kid at SC, or if I'm doing whatever, to me, or if I'm playing with my kids, doing a little, you know, iPhone video with a remote control helicopter in the living room, like, I treat, I treat all of those things with almost equal seriousness. There really is, the only difference is like, the quality of the cinematography, or the nature of the, like, I don't know, there's like a way you come at stuff, and like, I'm, I'm all in every time. I never, like, I can't halfway anything. And, uh, but this one in particular, you could tell that the idea, even though I didn't really understand Sauron and I didn't know all the kings and what the battles were, I didn't understand any of that stuff, but I knew what was at stake. And what was at stake is this idea of peace and preservation of the natural world and that Sam is, was uh, clearly an anchor for that. And so I just tried to own that and, uh, and that was it, it got the part, and it was like, it was pretty great. I was actually in my office, I had an office at that point, and I was in the office, I had an assistant, and uh, Jeff Owens was his name, and he said, Sean, I've got Mark Schwartz and Nikki Mirish on the phone for you. If there's bad news, only one agent calls you. The agent that drew the, drew the short straw in the staff meeting. <laughs> like, okay, you gotta call and give him the bad. If two agents call, it means they want to be a part of the good news and they want to be able to claim credit for it, you know, <laughs> at their lunches for the next rest of their life. Um, oh, yeah, so I represent Sean Ass. You know, of course, we put him in Lord of the Rings, and, you know, the agents are hilarious. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, Mark, who was a very loyal agent, um, and, uh, and Nikki, who had made that original call, called, and I, I walked over, and I knew I had it because it was both agents. But I picked up the phone, I was standing up, and I went like this, and Mark started yelling, you got it, you got it, you got it, you got it, you got it. And I went right down on my knee, put my head down, started crying and thanking God. Like, yeah. And I heard And I heard But we would have been here for Goonies anyway, but the point is. <laughs> true, speak it, preach. So, uh, but like I knew, I knew that it was the, like, I think probably in my lifetime, besides having, being married and having three daughters, like, that was, that's a communication that will endure for all time. Uh, and no matter how many franchises come and go, if it gets rebooted, I bet they, somebody will redo it, like, you know, in the next 10 years, somebody will redo it. Well, whatever. But they, um, but my point is just, like, nobody, it's so powerful. Howard Shore's mu music is so powerful. The, the, the performances, the cast, so powerful. That amazing marriage of miniatures and blue screen technology and Gollum, like, nothing like that had ever been done before. I mean, you, you had like Roger Rabbit and you had other things where they were trying to do interplay between animated and, and real life, but they, they literally pushed the technology. And, uh, and so that, that it was a moment in cinema history, you know, it's only been around 120 years movies really um and they're kind of benchmark moments you know color sound you know certain when when they realized that the camera didn't have to be static when all of a sudden they started putting a dolly involved you know they could do this all the time up and down left and right but when they when the crane would come in and all those classic like shots of directors in the 1950s you know in the western with the crane coming down you know or, or putting a camera on a car. Like there are just certain moments when technology just leapt forward and it changed storytelling. And Lord of the Rings came out and absolutely without question gave birth to thousands of things just like it. 
I mean, I don't know how far Harry Potter was in its, in its trajectory of getting made as movies. It, and and it, it, might have, it might have been, it might have been happening roughly simultaneously, but it is so clear when you watch sequences and they're using the same software, the actual, like the same computer software to create some of the effects that they're doing. Like the Balrog and then one of the monsters in, uh, in Harry Potter, I was watching it and I was like, it's the Balrog. <laughs> like, um, so, yeah, so I knew that that was, that I was in, in, one of my favorite prayers is allow me to be an instrument of your will. I just love that prayer. Um, the idea that, you know, we're, and actors do that. Actors are, are vessels. I studied with Stella Adler um, for a little while, and um, when she was very old, but she's still sharp as a tack. And she talked about how it's really the playwright, it's really the author that is, that is driving it and the ideas of the offer. And she would look out at a group of 100 you know, actors sitting there just listening to every breath she would take and trying to you know, learn from her. And, and uh, she would say, there's a lot of actors in this room. She said, what we need in the American theater are more writers. You know, she was like, people have to have something to say. People need to be able to look at what's going on in the world and make it make sense for each other. You know, I can't imagine what she would be thinking in the Trump era. You know, and the, the need for people like it, his his election has created the greatest flourishing of a of an industry since the internet. Satire, political satire. It's like there's never been a greater moment. You know, maybe Hitler, but like too soon. You know, <laughs> too soon. Uh, you know, so he's he's created this thing. But like, what we really need is to try and understand what ideas are are driving that, I mean, the very nature of facts and truth are being pulled apart with taffy. Like, it's, we really need writers to come in and do that. And the actor, your job is to communicate the ideas of the playwright as effectively as possible. And so for Lord of the Rings and for Tolkien, who was such a, an extraordinary, I'll tell you what I really loved. I read the books three times while we were filming, top to bottom. Finished it, started over. Top, we had a lot of time to sit around on that movie, so I would uh, I would read it and and really studied it and loved it. But what I loved almost more than that, or what made me appreciate it more than the actual text itself, was the collection of letters that you can get, Tolkien's letters, where you get his kind of unvarnished uh, attitude towards, say, Disney. Not a fan. <laughs> Not a fan. I had this moment when they were opening downtown. You guys been to Disney mm -hmm. out in West yeah. Coast? Yeah. There's downtown Disney. They have had a Disney World as well. Yeah. Yeah. But the, yeah. So this was in Anaheim, and uh, Michael Eisner is there, and we we're talking. And he's always a very like lovely guy and very open to be around. You know, the this titan of industry. And uh, we were there, and he he said, you know, what was it like with the feet? You know, and I described the feet and the ears and the hair and how long it took. And I mean, I, I don't think he was putting on airs or, you know, he didn't have to perform for anybody. He already had the keys to the kingdom, literally. And uh, <laughs> he, he said, he goes, I just don't think I could do it. And, I was, and it was nice. It was nice to have the head of the studio, the guy who literally can breathe life into people's imagination and stuff. Uh, sort of look at me and sort of like say I, I did something impressive that he maybe probably couldn't have done. And uh, so I like that. And then, uh, <laughs> and then he said, uh, and then we, we shook hands or whatever, and then he turned to his son, I think Breck, is it Breck? Eisner? I can't remember the name of his son, but his son was there. And I heard him say about the Lord of the Rings, should I have bought that? <laughs> <laughs> also, like Tolkien, kind of going, oh, jeez, in his grave, and uh, you know, each movie made over a billion dollars. So, like, you know what? Don't buy Lord of the Rings. Go buy all of Star Wars. You can run with that for a while. And Marvel. And I just saw Iger talking about uh, those. Like, there's a freeze. That I hate. There's a word that I hate. Hate. 
hate in the context that it's used. Actually, you can, you can pair it with another word. Content. Content. Oh, well, we're working with some content creators. It's like, what was Mozart? Sort of a note arranger? Like, <laughs> content creator. It just sounds so kind of like antiseptic and horrible. Like, you're artists, you're creating, you're, you're, it's your imagination, you're telling stories. It's Sadly, people don't hire artists, they, they don't. will hire content creators. It's true. <sighs> Well, whoever they are, I hate them. And you yeah. can tell them I said so. Amen to that. I'd love to be hired as an artist, but, you know. Yeah. Well, I, I, profession, I don't mind being a professional. Right. You know, you have to show up on time. You have to know your craft. you got to deliver a product. Here's what's really hard is the marketplace is it's brutal, and it's not always right. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, the marketplace doesn't select for the highest quality fare. And it's, it's rough to know that. It's even rougher to do something and go like, what I did isn't as good as what that other guy did. <laughs> it's brutal. It's brutal to think like, and you know, when it's art, you're not supposed to make comparisons. It, but it's important to be honest in business. And you know, artists, some of the greats talk about the importance of truth. I think we're, we're, come, we're settling on a theme here, people. The truth. <laughs> the truth is an idea. But anyhow. So it's a privilege to be an ambassador for some of those big ideas. And, and, and I took that role very, and continue to take that role very seriously. And I'll also do Adam Sandler movies where I, you know, <laughs> put a banana in your ass. Yeah. Uh, so